One of the most hated and contemptible words in the English language, I know for sure, is the word fool. No one likes to be called a fool. And even though nobody likes it, the fact remains that some are fools according to the Word of God. If a man calls me a fool, I can debate it. But if God calls me a fool, there is no debate. So today, I'm not asking for a man's opinion about another man, but about what really matters. See, it doesn't matter what another man thinks about another man. But what God thinks about me, or anybody else, is extremely important. So what I'm asking is this. According to God's Word, are we fools? The Bible says we are fools if we say there is no God. In Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That makes it simple, doesn't it? According to the Bible, anyone who would say there is no God is a fool. It doesn't matter if you have an IQ of 160 or if you have three PhDs and can speak 16 languages. There is too much evidence supporting God's existence to deny or even doubt it. And as we view the vast, beautiful, intricate universe around us, we know that it did not happen by mere chance. There is a maker. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the words that so many people know, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. The Bible teaches the evidence of God's existence is so strong, so overwhelming, so convincing, that the one who denies God is without excuse. In Romans 1, verse 20. Now, here's one of the illustrations somebody sent me. One day, a young disbeliever told an old Quaker that he wouldn't believe in anything that he had not seen. And the old Quaker asked, he said, Didst thee ever see France? And the young man said, No, sir, but others have, and so my reason allows me to believe in its existence upon their testimony. Ah, thou wilt believe only in what thee or another hast seen. That's exactly right. That's my firm belief, said the boy. Well, the wise old Quaker then asked, Didst thee ever see thy brains? No, sir. Didst thee ever see anyone who has seen them? No, sir. And the old Quaker said, then dost thee believe thee has any? I like it. We are fools if we say there is no God. We're fools if we get drunk. Now, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, in 2,000 years ago, they didn't have, I, I would suspect, they didn't have as many ways of getting high as we have today. There were more than just alcohol, but there are so many more today. We have people getting high on alcohol, on uh, uh, herbs, on illegal drugs, prescription drugs, on heroin and methamphetamine and so many other things. Glue paint thinner, you name it, people are, are looking for ways to, to uh, mess up their brains. But in the Bible, it's generally talking about alcohol. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, Solomon said that wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. If I'm not wise, what am I? I'm a fool. Proverbs 23, starting in verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. 
Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? He's confused. He's a red-eyed brawler who talks too much. That's the story. That's the passage in a nutshell. There's a story told about a man who was addicted to strong drink and who could never find his house when he started home in the dark. And so finally he decided to hang a lantern on his gate post. That way he would know which house was his. He did so and in the late hours of the night he started home. He came to where he could see the lantern. Yep, that's my lantern, he said. He took it down and went on further. Yep, that's my door. He opened it and he went inside. Yep, this is my living room. He held the lantern up so that he could see and he saw his wife sitting there on the couch in the arms of another man. Yep, that's my wife. And oh, ain't that sweet. There I am loving on her. Hey, wait a minute. If that's me on the couch, who's this crazy fool standing here holding this lantern? Well, not only does alcohol make an utter fool out of you, it does an untold amount of harm to others around you. Just thinking about our area, and I'm sure it's like that in other parts of the world, how many children have done without food, clothing, other essentials of life because of alcohol? How many spouses have been beaten and deprived of a decent home because of alcohol? How many innocent people have lost their lives in car wrecks because someone was under the influence of alcohol? Truly, the one deceived by it is not wise. I spent 34 years in the military. My first four years were uh, enlisted and working on the flight line. And I got to know a lot about people in that four years, my first four years. And I would watch people uh, go and get drunk. And I had various friends that would get into one kind of trouble or another mainly by drinking. And so I speak from experience when I say a person has to be a fool to get drunk like this, to not know where he's at or what he's doing. I had one friend that uh, started drinking and got into a poker game. You know how hard it is to win at poker if you're drunk? Well, he lost all his money. We were overseas. And uh, he left and went through the wrong door and ended up on the fire escape and fell down it and almost killed himself. They found him lying out by the road. They took him to the hospital, patched him up. And he missed a few days work because, primarily, of his drinking. And I can tell you so many other stories, but we really don't have time. I think you understand the bottom line. Truly, we are fools if we get drunk. And then on the more spiritual uh, plane, we are fools if we only hear the Word of God. Now, I'm glad we hear it, but we have to do more than that. I meet people every day who know what the Bible says, but who will not admit to what it means. They're content to know the Word, but they refuse to heed what it says. There are millions of people like that in the world today. They know so much of the Bible. They know they should submit their lives to Jesus. They know they should live righteously. They know they should faithfully attend worship. 
they know they should be kind and they know they should read the scriptures and visit the sick and uh, the wayward. But they're content to do nothing and often excuse themselves by saying something like, well, I know what is right. The bottom line is hell will be filled with people who know what is right, but who do not do it. Knowledge is not enough. A person has to be a doer of the word. Matthew 7, 21. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There are a lot of people that call Jesus Lord, address him as Lord, but who do not do God's will. Luke 6, 46 says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Over in James 1, 22, we're told, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And then later on in James chapter 4, verse 17, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Next, we are fools if we sow one thing in life and expect to reap something else in death. What would you think of a man who planted Johnson grass and expected to get tomatoes from it? Does that sound wise or foolish? Well, so is the man who thinks that he can plant a life of sin and harvest something else in death. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. In Luke 16, 29 through 36, Jesus tells the well-known story about the rich man and Lazarus. You know the account. The rich man lived a good life. Lazarus was a beggar. When the rich man died, he went to torment because of what he had sown in life. And Lazarus went to his rest in paradise. When the rich man complained about his fate, Abraham said, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. One time a Sunday school teacher told his class about the rich man and Lazarus, and when he finished the lesson, he asked the class, which would you rather be, the rich man or Lazarus? And one boy promptly answered, I would be the rich man while I live and Lazarus when I die. Now that's not, he's, he wasn't being smart. He was just saying what most people really want. They want to live like the devil now and go to heaven later. See, the boy didn't know it, but he expressed the desire of millions of people. They want to live like the rich man and die like Lazarus, but nothing could be more impossible. We cannot live like the rich man and enjoy the blessings Lazarus had when he died. Why? Because the Bible says, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If we live like the rich man, forgetting God, forgetting man, we will be cast into the fires of hell, not for a day, not for a week, not for a year, not even for a thousand years, but for all eternity. Matthew 25, 41. Next, we are fools if we do not believe that Christ is coming again. The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is coming a second time to judge the world. John 14, verse 3 says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And then Hebrews 9, 28. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. 
You know, fools often mock this teaching by saying, where's the promise of his coming? You don't really believe Christ is coming again, do you? After all, it's been nearly 2,000 years since Christ made the promise. Maybe he's forgotten his promise or perhaps he's unable to come. Well, the Apostle Peter warned us that there would be men who would mock the second coming of Christ and contend that it was a myth or a fairy tale. But I want you to listen to the forceful way Peter refutes these mockers. Go with me to 2 Peter 3, 8 through 10. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Then it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So Peter answers these mockers by saying that the passing of time means nothing to the eternal God. A thousand years or even 10,000 years is a day to God. Don't even begin to think that just because he has not come yet means that he isn't coming. He's not on our timetable. We're on His. Well then, why hasn't He come? Peter goes on to say that the reason the Lord hasn't come yet is due to His patience, His long-suffering. God wants all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. He does not want any to perish, so He delays. If you're not a Christian, he is delaying for you. He doesn't want any to perish. But the day will come when the Lord will suddenly appear as a thief in the night to judge man and destroy the works in this world. 2 Peter 3 verse 11 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? The answer to that question is obvious. Don't be a fool. We should be a prepared people. For only prepared people will be saved in that great day. The time to make preparation for that great day is now. Tomorrow may be too late. Tomorrow death may overtake us or Jesus may suddenly appear without warning. In fact, Jesus could appear today. If Jesus were to appear today, would you be saved or lost? Would you uh, greet the Lord with joy? Or would you cry out loud and try to hide in the darkest, most secluded corner of the world? Why not make preparation by giving your life to Jesus today? By expressing your trust in Him believing He's the Son of God, repenting of your sins, being buried with Him in baptism, live for Him all your days, and I thank you for listening to our program today. If you're not a Christian, change that today. Don't be a fool.